Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. Today we're going to talk about something that many of our users have been discussing for months, and that is using the AMD Epic 7002 series, codenamed Rome, in workstations. This was originally going to be an article solely on our website, but since I want to do more videos this year, I figured as part of our New Year's resolution, we really needed to have a video in the first week. It also didn't hurt that I wanted to try the new camera. So if you haven't already, subscribe for what promises to be more YouTube content this year from STH. Okay, back to Epic workstations. Ever since the AMD Epic 7002 series ROM launch with up to 64 cores per socket, people have been asking whether they should be using workstations. Clock speeds are generally okay, still reaching up to maybe 3.2, 3.4 gigahertz in turbo frequencies. And if you compare that to modern mainstream desktop parts, you know, they often reach into the four to five gigahertz range. And that's a fairly big delta. But if you look at like modern notebooks, things are a bit different. Although single and dual core notebook CPU frequencies are generally higher, once you get to like four to six cores on Intel mobile CPUs and they get loaded, you start seeing clock speeds often drop into the lower part of the three gigahertz range. And that's just like the AMD Epic ROM series. So clock speeds of Epic are now somewhere not as good as mainstream desktop, but are likely not that far off from modern notebooks, which makes them kind of acceptable for normal use. And the other side to this is that the AMD EPIC line has a number of single socket only SKUs that are lower cost. You can get a 64 core AMD EPIC 7702P for $4,425 or slightly less than the Intel Xeon W 3275 28 core part that we just reviewed last year. We'll put links to both reviews in the description, but AMD designates these single socket only parts with a P and discounts them by 11 to 31% over their dual socket counterparts. And that makes these chips very attractive to a specific market. And that market is the users of single and dual Intel Xeon workstations, especially now that one can have more cores in a single socket than two Intel Xeon sockets. So beyond the P-series parts, there are chips out there like the 16-core AMD EPIC 7282 and the 12-core EPIC 7272 that are priced under $650, making them less expensive than the desktop Ryzen 3950X. Of course, with ROM, one also gets up to 128 PCIe Gen 4 lanes and up to 4 terabytes of memory support, and you can use up to 16 ECC RDIMMs and LRDIMMs in an 8-channel configuration. That means you can get a lot of technical jargon in there, but it basically means you can use more PCIe adding cards like GPUs, NVMe SSDs, and network adapters. And you can also have a lot more RAM with Epic than mainstream CPUs. Last year, we built a workstation we dubbed the Ultra Epic. With that system, we took a barn find unused inbox Sun Ultra 24 workstation and converted it into a modern workstation or tower server with a previous generation Epic 7371 high frequency 16 core CPU. That system worked reasonably well, but it ended up getting relegated to virtualization host duties after we were done with the showcase on the website. We're going to link that one in the description. If we get a lot of interest, we could always look at updating that system for ROM, but it was really cool. It's certainly possible to make a workstation using AMD Epic. We even did that in this case using a 12-year-old retro or classic case. All through the Intel Xeon E5 V1 to V4 era, I used a dual Xeon workstation. And I'm not a huge gamer, but I do use Windows 10 plus Hyper-V for local development. And dual Xeons have plenty of CPU power for that kind of use case, along with memory and PCIe expansion capabilities that I and others need. The last iteration of the workstation with dual Xeon E5 2690 V4s that I used had clock speeds ranging from 2.6 to 3.5 gigahertz, or about what the clock speed of the new ROM chips do. But the new Epic parts have higher IPC in most cases, and what that means is that the AMD Epic 7002 series CPU cores do more work per clock cycle than the older Xeon E5 do at a given clock speed. When the original Threadripper came out, I immediately went to it and I said, hey, I'm going to go out and buy this thing. I bought the Threadripper 1950X for my personal workstation. This was before the Ultra Epic, but I also wanted to show that, you know, if we're going to recommend a technology, that I'm willing to use it myself. The first generation of Epic codenamed Naples was worked fine in servers, but lower clock speed parts were not really ideal for desktops, and that's all that was available at launch. Threadripper packaged Epic into a workstation form factor with increased clock speed, but also less I.O. and memory, and that kind of made sense. A few weeks ago, I just rebuilt my workstation. It may surprise many of our readers, but I decided against going with the AMD Epic 7002 ROM series for the build. Part availability and budgets were really not the reason I decided against this. I mean, we have absolutely everything. 
Instead, it's because the new AMD Ryzen Threadripper CPUs came out, and realistically, the third generation AMD Ryzen Threadripper CPUs are Epic CPUs in disguise. They're using a version of the Epic IO die, the cores are the same, sockets are similar, although electrically they're a bit different. Um, you know, Epic is still more of a robust platform, but Threadripper hit the sweet spot for me. Previously, you know, as a dual Xeon user, it kind of worked. Now, taking a quick second to do the comparison, the AMD Epic parts have 128 PCIe Gen 4 lanes. The Ryzen Threadripper has more like half of that, depending on how you count chipset lanes and get into that whole thing. But the AMD Epic 7002 series parts also have eight channel memory and can do up to two DIMMs per socket. In contrast, the 32 core Threadripper 3970X that I used only has about half that. Both of these changes make a lot of sense. Desktop workstations are generally need to be either ATX or EATX to take advantage of the robust chassis ecosystem, and putting 16 DIMM slots plus a relatively large socket creates space issues for the platform if you also need to expose 128 PCIe Gen 4 lanes. Memory is a big deal. The one item I constantly beg AMD for is ECC RDIMM support even if LR DIMMs are not supported. ECC RDIMMs at 32 gigabytes and larger DIMM sizes are often less expensive than their desktop counterparts. There's also a difference in the support world when ECC memory is explicitly supported by the CPU vendor like with Epic versus being a feature a motherboard vendor can optionally implement as is the case with the 3970X. With ECC RDIMM support, one could relatively and inexpensively do 8 by 64 gig DIMMs for half, half a terabyte of RAM. While many users will not need a half a terabyte of RAM, I would argue that we need platforms that can expand the capabilities in the market. If one can ha get a half terabyte of memory for under $2,500 or price in line with a CPU or high-end GPU like a Titan RTX, then that provides the ability for software developers and users to explore new applications. Checking out my build picture for a second, one can see that I'm using the Threadripper 3970X alongside a Titan RTX GPU. That's a great pairing at the moment. I snapped these photos just before finishing the build and I had an eight terabyte Intel Enterprise NVMe SSD fail, which was planned for the build. That was totally a bummer. And I also had a Sabrent PCIe Gen 4 NVMe SSD that was DOA. So it never made it into the build. We also needed my Mellanox PCIe Gen 4 NIC in the lab that week. So that was absent when I took the photo. What are you gonna do? And you know, it's still a straight replacement of the previous Threadripper 1950X build. I just took the old motherboard out, put it in, and everything's now better, right? Clock speeds when doing tasks such as Camtasia screen recording production with the Threadripper 3970X at 4.15 gigahertz or so. And you know, these high clock speeds are generally great when app applications are just not using all the cores. When you're doing screen capture work for some of our videos, for example, the difference is readily apparent when you go to produce the videos. Also for those keen eye viewers, I'm using Oloi RAM, although I have no idea how to say is YOLO backwards. So Oloi, I don't know. The 32 gig DDR4 3200 gig DIMMs were inexpensive and it worked perfectly well. It hurts a server person to have to spend more for consumer UDIMs than ECC RDIMs of the exact same size. And that's a problem with the UDIM memory on Threadripper. Desktop memory pricing is crazy if you're coming from the server world. I'm not a huge fan of having all the RGB LEDs, but I know many are, and so that's okay. And still I'd argue that aesthetics aside, probably the biggest advantage for Threadripper, aside from those clock speeds over ROM, comes down to motherboards. We've reviewed TRX40 boards from ASUS and MSI, as well as Epic ATX boards from Supermicro, Gigabyte, and others. A stark contrast involves features such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, onboard audio, USB Type-C ports, and other workstation-friendly options. A lot of these, you know, you can add by, via PCIe adding cards or USB 3 dongles on Epic platforms, but it's nice on the Threadripper platforms that it all works out of the box. Someone who previously used dual Xeon platforms like me and had to go the way of expansion devices. It's far, not, you know, impossible or anything like that, but it's also way less convenient. AMD Epic Roam can have features such as remote management, which some organizations will require. That becomes a binary decision point for those organizations. And AMD has already announced that they'll have a 64 core Threadripper parts to match AMD Epic Roam core counts. And that's great. To do this, we wanna see AMD move to eight-channel memory and figure out how to open up the TDP beyond 280 watts to allow these cores to hit high sustained clock speeds. AMD can also add ECC RDIMM support and more PCIe lanes if they wish. I mean, after all, the AMD Epic Roam IODI has these features and realistically, 
once the 64 core thread over parts launch, it's gonna be harder for buyers to choose Epic CPUs for workstations, at least at the high end. There is one major segment that can still be ripe for Epic workstations, and that is the lower end. This may seem completely counterintuitive for a line that can hit 64 cores, yet the AMD Epic 72, 72, and 7282 offer essentially 12 to 16 cores at laptop core speeds. They also benefit though from 64 megs of level three cache, so they punch above what one would expect from a three gigahertz-ish CPU. Where they really shine is in IO. If you do tasks such as GPU compute or need a lot of fast local storage, then the PCIe IO capabilities are fabulous. Better yet, the chips have a list price somewhere between the $625 to $650 range, which makes them relatively affordable. Another option is the AMD Epic 7302P with its 128 megs of level three cache and 16 cores. If you need local storage array, then one can even get motherboards such as the Supermicro H11 SSL and C Rev2 that we reviewed with an onboard SAS3 controller. These are probably not ideal AAA gaming platforms, but if you're gonna look more for a professional application, then they can certainly make sense. Okay, summing this all up, we get asked a lot about using AMD Epic CPUs in workstations. Believe me, I ask AMD constantly for high clock Epic parts that align with the Threadripper side. Still, I think if you're gonna look at a workstation, the appeal of a user-friendly comforts and you know all the stuff that the consumer motherboards have is really hard to pass up. For example, the camera I'm recording this on, as well as the audio recorder and our new product photo camera, all use USB Type-C connectivity, which server motherboards just don't have. It just makes things easier to have platforms designed for the purpose rather than adapting. Still, that 12 to 24 core market looks very interesting for those who are willing to sacrifice the clock speed for IO and memory. There, the AMD Epic Rome series has a compelling value proposition in the workstation market. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Feel free to subscribe to our channel and check out the STH main site for more great content that the STH team puts out every single day. As you may have noticed from this video, we're working on implementing better video setups to make these short bits a little bit more impactful. So feel free to leave comments. We're trying and we're gonna get there someday. Thanks for watching.